I'm going to go ahead and announce the titles. I see you have the program director as well. Our first paper, we're getting set up, connecting to the Zoom. Valentina, uh, from Humboldt University of Berlin, we'll be talking about the combination of musical semiotics and instrumentation in Brahms opera by Dr. Noel Meyer. We'll have this PowerPoint up here in a minute. Yeah, we're doing it. We're waiting for the handshake between Zoom and his own PowerPoint. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to my presentation. First of all, I will thank you for the organization for the wonderful conference. And my name is Wantana Tanjaran Pon. I come from Thailand and graduated from, from Humboldt University, Berlin. And now I work as lecturer at uh, Chuangon University, Bangkok, Thailand. And fly, I fly direct from Bangkok to visit this conference and let me fly back. <laughs> Only for this conference. Okay. Uh, the topic of my paper is the combination of musical semiotic and instrumentation in song opera by Giacomo Mayer. Uh, this subject can be looked under the following heading. I think many, many people know about Giacomo Mayer. I think together. Yeah, yeah, Giacomo Mayer. Okay, I will scope some. Very important about the uh, Giacomo Meyerbeer. I think the PDF is work. Hmm. Okay. No. Oh, okay. Meyerbeer was born on five September at uh, seventeen ninety one in Berlin and died second May eighteen sixty four in Paris. Uh, since eighteen five, Meyerbeer was received a uh, composition lesson from. Uh, Crowd with his shelter, and then with uh, Berha and Sam Weber, which along ignited his periodical passion during the time. Uh, he was in the environment of the musical composition and performance of the court of Berlin. Until 26 March 1810, his first day the picture in that new machine was premiered. And the second, this one, uh, next guy. It's very important and influenced from Meyerbeer based Abbe Bachner. After Meyerbeer had a composition lesson in Berlin, Meyerbeer had a composition and instrumentation, instrumentation technique with, with uh, Abbe Bachner in Darmstadt. Abbe Bachner is one of the most important composers in Mannheim School in German in that time. Uh, the compositional work by Bachner includes almost every formula. He wrote numerous writing of music theory and instrumentation. Among them is the Deutsche Encyclopedia from 18, uh, 1785 and uh, the Betrachtung der Mannheimer Schule in 1778, which are important textbooks of that time. The two of textbooks, the Betrachtung der Mannheimer Tonschule und the Deutsche Encyclopedia, is where uh, they are very important textbooks from Meyerbeer. They have many about the instrument, instrumentation aesthetic that Maya Bell learned in, in that time. At that time, at the Faulkner time and Manhattan Schuller, the basic idea was uh, the emancipation of classical aesthetic by the uh, presentation of the new instrument and new range of the instrument. The important, uh, the important, the important basic and the conception of arrangement the perception of painting and music and the musical painting are still become apparent in Meyerbeer class by Faulkner. The main conception by Faulkner, as I told, is clearly recognized that he per uh, he, uh, his perception between sound with the ear and color with the eye. This is the main concept from Faulkner. And the instrumental method you gained important in the next century and it happened and it's up here in the same scene of the color of every instrument in Maya Bear works. Here it's become apparent that the starting point of the music dramatic instrumentation of Maya Bear was directly influenced by the central aspect folklore. The musical description of the orchestra color prayer and enormous role in Maya Bear's dramaturgical music design. In addition, the multiplication of the orchestration leads to the diversity of timber, of color. Meyer Bear made great process after his piano lesson with Popular first and then composed his opera Gipsus Geloida. It was premiered in Munich on 23rd December 1812. His next step was at Wirt und Gas and premiered in Stuttgart in 1814. 
in Vienna at this period, Mayaba was best known as an outstanding pianist. Mayaba visited Italy for the first time in 1816, that he truly became a composer of opera and began his career by using, using the Italian form of his name, Giacomo. The first name of Maya Bear is Jacob Bear. And then when Maya Bear visited to Italian, Maya Bear won that to, to like an Italian name. That, that means Maya Bear name is Giacomo and then Maya Bear. In the same year, spent his time in South Italian Sicilia and recorded a few folklore of the city. The success of Maya Bear first commission in Viennese is Emma Dulux Dorgo, was thus the most important to him. The Scottish local color and romantic top boy of the setting. Give Maya Bear his first opportunity to show his skill in depicting character and scenic background. The first of its historical subject and the characterization, as well as the situation deceiving opera, was the Margareta di Anjou, based on the legend about the English laws for training. The last opera from Italian is Il, uh, Il Corriato Ichetto, was the last historical Italian opera before late Italian. The next important thing about Maya Bear is, it's a very important idea of Maya Bear aesthetic. Was the French team couleur local, from the, from the term couleur local or local color, appears since the 17th century in the field of painting. The 18th century was the importance of local color, was able to characterize a uh, regional uh, peculiarity, and it appeared to prefer the conveyor from Victor Hugo in 1827. Victor Hugo see the couleur local or local color as the mean of the characterization, and the couleur local should not be up, should not be applied as a mere vanish, but rather should feel the heart of the work itself, and as its work transcends into all mystic of the drama. With the choice of the operatic material, Maya Bear obviously show the way to compose the historical opera and the basic concept of colonial was in preparatory step. At this point, it can be noticed that the instrumentation of Maya Bear was gradually structured. Now let's look at the first Kong opera by Giacomo Maya Bear. Here the example. A characteristic of the drum opera is represented by a large scene, a large two boy, or a ballet pronounced, as mentioned. The drum opera of Maya Bear had the historical subject for design, color, lo local color include. The first drum opera from Maya Bear was Le Bella di Ave and was immediately successful from the first night on 21st November 1831 at the Opera Le Palatia. The opera is about a historical color of the uh, 13th century in Palermo. The plot of the opera is based on a reverse element in the dramaturgical center is Lover, the youth of Normandy, and he finds his great love in Isabella, the daughter of the Sicilian king. You can see the two states of the opera, Normandy and Sicilian. The two main characters come from two regions, and the first act gives Maya Bear the musical idea of two cities. Yadis, Feni, and Normandy, sung by the Rembrandt for the representation of Normandy and Opportuna upon Happy, which presented by Robert for Sicilian. Now, we show you first here. Not true. It's a bit much better. Okay. okay Maya Bad used the ballad as a musical description on the demonic history of Normandy, as well as the local of the local situation. He also connects the musical color with the figure. The dark tone represented by the low pitch, a demonic drawing, always in the dramaturgical action accord. The sound idea of the demonic figure is already in the oasis presented. Then Maya Bear connects the demonic sound conception with the rivetto and now he associated with the couleur local, the local situation from which Lobert and Bethlehem come. After the, after the presentation of the couleur local of Normandy, Maya Bear want to show musical style presentation of Sicilian for the first time in his opera. This, this one is Ballard and the second one is Sicilian. At the beginning of this uh, Sicilian 
a character of folk lead become uh, accentuated by the musical ornamentation. The horn and the deep steel instrument dominate in the ballad of Normandy. They set especially the dark tone color, the combination of low pitch. In contrast, the kulunika of the Sicilian dance with the woodwind and string instrument presented beside the bright color get shown in the scene in the high pitch instrument in F major. After, consider after considering the kulunika of the two scenes, show up obviously that Maya make a scheduled use of the instrumentation and kulunika. Now I will show. Oh, okay. Need to script the. Okay. Okay, I wish I saw first. Sorry for a minute, share sound and then. Okay. And now the second one. Yeah, like this and the first example. And then I'm back to. Share screen again and then share. Oh, okay. The third act is about the demonic occurrence of background and leads to increasing tension of the dramaturgy. On the one hand, a dialogue between two plays musical level are significant. Too. On the other hand, he wins the musical description immensely important. The vow is not really about the kulunoka of particular pairs, but the expression of dramaturgical thought to Ricky and an opera scene. The musical environment of the scene is in a cave called Bedram enter to connect with the demon of the other world. Maya Bear create two musical ensemble. One, one is a main stage orchestra, and the other according to the score Musique de la Cousine, music behind, uh, music behind the screen. The musical coloring becomes clear through the split to orchestration plan. The main orchestra represents the pot in clear, why the incident music is used for the spiritual figure of hell. Maya there obviously used the orchestra, the robot instrument, exclusively on the state music in this scene. At this new idea of the sound was the intention of the composer to unusual build sound aesthetic and connect with the demonic figure with dramaturgical plot. The orchestra was rarely seen in orchestration at that time because of a new instrument and a new invention. Oh. 
Yeah, then you saw this, the uh, Maya back connect the instrument, connect the instrument with the, the scene and the prop. Okay, I will script this one and go to, okay. For more than 30, 34 years, Maya Bear will live in the form of Bella after he lived Italian. The analysis revealed that Maya Bear violent instrument used to create the new perspective of illustrated dramaturgical style conception. The development of the orchestra apparatus is also an important facet to the dramaturgical design of the set. The instrument combination is the important one reason to the new instrumentation and the extended pitch of the instrument in the scope of Maya Bear. The design of colonial culture after this tail consideration that the extension of the musical element can make the musical coloring possible. According to my analysis and according to the critical edition of the recording publishing become the table of the orchestra, orchestra apparatus here. I uh, you can see the table of the development of the orchestra apparatus can be seen as noticeable. As the function of the bass and bass instrument increase and the case is not just the main orchestra expense, but also the incidental music or state music. By complementing the instrument is opportunity to create a wider sound idea. As mentioned at the beginning, uh, the musical technique could account demand a certain sound design to precise environment and the particular situation can be expanded. This has the consequence of the representing of numerous and new element. In conclusion, for the, for the observation and imitation of certain situations, Maya Bear design systematic instrumentation. The semantic meaning of Maya Bear always used instrumentation in the dramaturgical plot and relate the zip. He used the characteristic of the length of the instrumentation for the dramaturgical figure as a fundamental element and the basic con conception of Maya Bear development. Basic principle of, and the basic of principle of Wackler too. I hope we will, we will have can insight to the musical semiotic from Maya Bear and Carl Ovila from Maya Bear. And thank you very much for your attention. And you're sorry for some technical problems. Thank you very much. We have time for a couple of questions. Well, I might start with one. Um, what impact, you mentioned the, the Italian influence in the music in Paris. What impact might the German Romantic Opera have had on Maya Bear? With its coloristic from E.T.A. Hoffman and, and Weber. Yeah, of course. It got, uh, first, it's uh, about the instrumentation. The instrumentation. The very important thing is the low instrument of the Kalida and bass saxophone and baritone saxophone and new the new family of the instrument. It's a big impact on Maya Bear. The Maya Bear has the idea of emancipation of the the old the old aesthetic from classical. To the to the Roman romantical era. I noticed also you may not have been able to see the increase in the percussion battery uh, across the years in those four operas. Yeah. Just exponential. Yeah. The sound colors that he's getting beyond the classical <laughs> orchestra. Yes. Right. Are there other questions? If not, we will thank you very much and move on now to our next. Thank question. you very much. So, um, Stefano for us. So, Stefano? Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Excellent. I will try to show you something about the theater Olympic in the chance, even if I'm not there with you. Go ahead. Let's try to follow me, okay? Okay, first off, uh, you have to permit me to, to share the video. Yes, but it's lower the volume. Oh, yes. Yeah, I'm lowering it. Sorry? I'm lowering it. Okay. <laughs> I cannot share. Okay. Let's try now. Olympic theater in Vicenza. I'm trying. Okay, just a moment, please. Okay, here we are. Do you see? Not yet. Not yet. And now? No. No, not yet. Just a moment. Uh, did you permission? Yes, I, I did it. Yeah. 
just a moment. Allora, ok. Just a moment. Here we are. Yes. Good. Ok. Allora, io lì ti chiedo in discenza. I've been working there for one year in 1999. It is a wonderful place. If you don't know it, I advise you, you have to go and visit it. Listen to me and come with me. I'm not a musician, I'm a semiologist, so my uh, paper will not focus on music. On the other hand, I would prefer to analyze shapes and images. Okay. This is a, a photo of a modern representation, classical representation or jazz representation in the Olympic theater. If you don't know it, you may think that is a Greece or Roman theater. It is not. It is a classical theater well, can you... designed by Andrea Pallago in 1579. Stefano, uh, Stefano sorry. Can... You need to start your slideshow. So we can see the larger slide. I don't understand what. That's perfect. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. This is good. Okay. You, you can, uh, can you enter on full screen here on PowerPoint? Okay. It's okay now. We can see it. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, this is a, uh, a photo of the Teatro Olimpico 2022 20, years ago. Uh, it is wonderful, but it is a fake theater in some way. Now, it tries to be an ancient theater, but it is not. Okay, let's focus on the, its role. No? The role played by the Teatro Olimpico in the evolution of Western theater has been a core topic at the center of many discussions and analysis since its construction in the end of 16th century, uh, from 1579 to 1585 by Andrea Palladio, his son Silla, and then in the end by Vincenzo Scamozzi. Uh, it is uh, uh, a complex architectural and performing structure. Uh, how would you describe it? A peculiar dramatic creature the last of the ancient theaters, the first of the modern ones, or something different. Uh, let's try to analyze these words. These, were, these words were pronounced by Angelo Ingenieri in 1598. He was the director of the first premiere in uh, 3 March 1885. I will uh, read the translation in English. And in short, the theaters will all want to be like the Olympico of Vicenza. Very noble witness of the splendor of that homeland and the magnanimity of those, those conditions. Quindi, uh, this is a kind of uh, wonderful response of the premiere. Now, these words, uh, uh, written by Angel Ingenieri, the uh, responsible for direction of lights, uh, of the Oedipus the Tyrant, uh, which was the endecasyllables version of Sophocles, Oedipus the, the King, would, be, would have been meaningless until 1585. This uh, lavish premiere uh, generated all around Europe an uh, interest in classical theater. In fact, this place, uh, from a physical uh, point of view, was not a theater at all. It was a custom post, a monastery, and a prison. Let's have a look to the structure. Okay, these are the, the external walls, which are medieval, and the plaza are the place. This is the interior, the courtyard. It is beautiful, but it is medieval. This is another point of view, medieval structure. If you enter, this is the audio and anti-audio, a kind of foyer in the modern theaters. 
and this is its interior, which is amazing in some ways. Uh, it seems to be a dream, a classical dream, enclosed in a medieval shell. Look at this. It's, you, I know it is small, but you can understand the structure of the theater. You know, we see the external walls, the courtyard, the medieval walls, and then the audio, and you enter the caveat, orchestra, proscenium, and front, front chair. This is the structure. Let's have a closer look. In the, there are 96 pages in this theater. I will, uh, I will uh, tell you a story about <clears throat> Napoleon. Allah, I've been working there in 1999 huh? as a touristic guide. No? And uh, some of the older guys told me a story about Napoleon. Napoleon, when he was in Italy, entered the theater and uh, thought he was in Greece. And just like his habit, uh, thought that he could bring in uh, France some stages. But they told him that the stages uh, weren't made of marble. He didn't believe. So uh, he drew his word and wanted one of the stages and understood that it was marble at home. Only plaster, stacco, and uh, papier mache. No, it's a fake theater, I was trying to understand. And from this point of view, you can understand uh, the real essence of this theater, a fake theater. Let's follow. OK, this is the facade, no? It seems to be a uh, uh, heart de triomphe. No, you can see in the center the main street. Uh, um, this is the, um, the street that it was thought to resemble the seventh street of the Epic of Thieves. No, the seventh street of Thieves. In the center, we can uh, we can see outside uh, behind the court, the ideal curtain city, an ideal city, which was conceived by Vincenzo Scamozzi in perspective. Okay, this is the plant, now you can see. Okay, up on the left, we have the anti-audio, the audio, the enter, caveat, columnade, orchestra, proscenium, and facade with the seven suites, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. This is the main street, the Yama Regia, no? If you look at this, you may think it is very long, but it is only less than 12 meters. It's perspective, no? The ceiling goes down and the roof go goes up. During the premiere, in fact, uh, the, di the director uh, used kids to uh, make it, to make it alive. No? If a man, an adult, goes up in the perspective, the illusion is destroyed. This is the motto of the Academy of Academici Olimpici the man who founded the theater. On the bottom, from Latin, Virtuti Ac Genio, Olimpico Academia, Theatrum Hoc a Fundamentis Erex. You know? uh, translating into English, uh, by means of virtues and intelligence, the Olympic Academia built this theater from the basis. But one of the most interesting thing are the words which you can see upstairs. This is the motto of the academic. Ho I don't know if you can see that. Hoc opus hic labor est. This is from Latin. It means this is our work. Look at it. Okay, 
This is an axonometry of point of view of the theater. You can see if you have a chance to. You know, the caveat is classical, semi elliptical the orchestra, proscenium, audion, and anti audion, facade, and the seven streets. This is another way of perceiving it. You see the proscenium with the actors that aren't allowed to enter the scenes. Otherwise, the illusion would be damaged. Okay. This is a paint of 18th century. You can see at the top the was a kind of bellarium, which was similar to the ones of the Roman theaters. And now this is a contemporary photo, no? You can see, you know, living people, actors, and statues, you know? There are more statues than people alive. It's, um, it's an astonishing effect. I've been working there for one year, and you know, in summer, when it was uh, desolated, it was very strange to be there with 96 statues. This is another photo. You, you can see by changing the light to the dark effect, it changed Oh, And this is another perspective. Now you can see by the colonnade uh, here, the uh, spectators aren't allowed to go. But since, since, there, uh, since that I was a touristic guide, I may see this perspective. But, you know, this is a, a, a musical signification conference. Uh, what does this theater, why this theater? Look at uh, this. Now, again, it's planned. Try to focus our, your attention on the, on the shape of the caveat and the street. This is the Olympic theater. On the left, we have the plant of the Teatro of Sabio Meta by Vincenzo Scamozzi, which can be considered very similar from an iconic point of view to the, the image on the right, two violas of the Renaissance period. No? In fact, the theater was made by wood and it, was an, it, it had an excellent, excellent, very, very good acoustic, no more. I will show you. But what is the, the role of this theater nowadays? No? A model, Hello, uh, I've been talking about the echo that the premiere had in March 1585. It should have become a model to follow and imitate, but if we exclude uh, Scamozzi's theater in Sabioneta, this theater remained an architectural performing unicum. Why? There are many reasons. Listen to the, these words by Renaud Schiavo. No? After the triumphant representation of Edipus the Tyrant, as life lasting for nearly three centuries, descended upon the Olympic. For almost three centuries, this theater was left abandoned. The academy had to meet expenses to restore its right, its finances. Still, on the other hand, an artifactor, the construction of the Olympic Theater had marked the close of a rich experimental period in which the theater of the classical antiquity had been restored to life, just as its inaugural performance, a kind, one of a kind, of Hedipus the Tyrant could be considered both the climax and the end of two centuries of theatrical experimentation, the two centuries of Renaissance theater, Italian Renaissance theater. Other reasons, the theater had a fixed scenery. It was not changeable at all. And this was, it's chifra, it's identity, it's strong identity, but at the same time was a limit. In fact, the Olympic theater could not satisfy the necessity of setting variation typical of just falling baroque theaters. 
characterized by changeable painted scenery. And so on, in following years, the interest in classical tragedy, typical of the, of the late Renaissance, would have weakened, replaced by the unstoppable achievement of new the new theatrical conventions. And uh, the Palladian shell was not comfortable, was not suitable. Let's try to, to follow me in this metaphor. Like a chrysalis that isn't able to get out of its cocoon, its cocoon can become a butterfly. The Olympic theater, a classical and self-celebrating dream of a political and economically sovereign elite has remained miraculously intact for more than four centuries. Paradoxically protected by those very solid medieval words so far from the Vitruvian Eurythmy, now you know the concept of Eurythmy, beauty and fitness in the adjustments of the members. Painstakingly pursued by its creator in all of his works. Palladian uh, was fascinated by Vitruvian Eurythmy, the uh, equilibrium of the parts in the whole. And uh, let's try to finish. What does it represent now? You know, in uh, some kind of uh, fancy metaphor, the Olympic theater has been compared. I don't know if you remember it, if, if you ever read the Promessive Post, you know? There was an old servant of Don Rodrigo, a minor character in the plot of the play, uh, of the novel by uh, Alessandro Manzoni. And this strange old man was, uh, uh, he used to spend the majority of his life alone and neglected in a room, just like the Olympic theater, abandoned. But sometimes he was shown almost like a trophy with all his refined elegance, the perfect tool to celebrate important guests. It was useful, but only sometimes. In the end, this was, in some way, the destiny of the Teatro Olimpico for more than 23 centuries. A costly and problematic dramatic machine to left, but also an infallible weapon useful to mesmerize dignitaries and noblemen. And so how would you define this theater? Some scholar expressed very um, strange definition of this. A place where only silence is suitable. You know, it's, uh, it's strange. The most eloquent funeral monument of Renaissance, the end of the Renaissance, a great theater of death. No? Anyway, the, the Olympico, with its wooden scenographies, uh, you know, I, I told you, they were originally conceived as a funeral. The scenography, the scenography by Vincenzo Scamozzi should have last only one evening, just like butterflies. But they are still there, despite wars, disaster, and several restorations. As regards the acoustics, the original acoustic was ruined by uh, use of concrete that was necessary to consolidate the caveat. In the end, I think that this word of Eugenio Barba uh, may describe the Olympic theater and other theater as well. The definition of theater, no? What is a theater? Building, the theater is the man and women who do hit. So Barba uh, underlines the importance of actors. But on the same hand, he says, Yet, when we visit the theaters of Dorton Cole, for sale, the Farnese Theater of Parma, and even the Olympic of Vicenza, we often experience some kinesthetic reactions that a living spectacle can give us. Those stones and bricks become living space, even if nothing is represented there. There are also a way of thinking and bringing of theater 
materializing it and pass it on for centuries. Thank you. So for this very poetic and, and fascinating study of a theater that no longer performs except in its own architecture. It's fascinating. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. I have a curiosity. And, um, you say you're not a musician, so they, you may not know the answer to this, but at the time, um, opera was just around the corner, right? And uh, were any musical events ever staged in this theater? What, what kind of event? Yeah, was it only spoken theater or was it out? Uh, it was thought to be a classical theater for tragedies, but nowadays they use it even for spectacles of jazz, ballads, operas, and so and even Shakespeare, whatever. So that's today, but back in back in 1585, no, it would never have been used for no, no, only for tragedies. Do you think any of the first operatic uh, scenographies uh, drew upon this design at all? Um, it, uh, I haven't understood your words, but I think that you said that uh, its characteristic, its features, is to be unique. No, it's front chain, it's magnificent, but even overpower for actual. When you ask an actor how, how it is to perform in the Olympic theater, it will tell you that it's difficult. Mm -hmm. And some way, in, in sometimes in the experimental theater of the 50s and 60s of the last century, they tried to cover the scenery. They were too strong, okay? And leave the actor's words on the stage. Huh. Interesting. Okay. Any other questions? Well, we are running short of time, so we will move on, but thank you very much for your contribution. I thank hope you. you stay with us observe for the remaining two papers. Thank you.
Everything here is deep around the USB connector. The LED compressor case is smooth and uniform, so it's not going to look like it's not. The whole project is rigorously rehearsed. It's an energetic and tight effort. Um, just to bring two together to soup is the Velo, perhaps unintentionally. In his 1919 um, essay, Gaston Hunger, The Uncanny, Sigmund Freud used this phrase at school to demonstrate how many languages in use today can only render the German expression and in payment of house by a haunted house. I'm haunted by it. So, spook haunted, roughly. So, interesting. I'm very familiar. But the mention of the house is significant. Freud's etymological musings concluded that Heinrich. The antonym of unheimlich, okay. Spooky. Um, <laughs> um, Freud's etymological musings concluded that heimlich, the antonym of unheimlich, um, can have two um, different meanings. Heimlich could mean homely, intimate, or heimlich. In relation to the Heimnis secret, can mean secrets that are concealed. So, in this light, Unheimlich, which in English is traditionally translated as the uncanny, isn't simply the opposite of familiar or belonging to the home, but rather it's bound up with knowledge and secrets. Freud eventually arrives at Friedrich Schelling's definition of the uncanny, in which, quote, everything is Unheimlich, <laughs> uncanny that ought to have remained hidden and secret, and yet come to light. Ought to have remained hidden and come to light. The uncanny, therefore, in Freud's reading, is not limited to the supernatural, but it encompasses a range of aesthetic and psychological phenomena, all of which Freud ultimately connects to repression, most often of, quote, infantile factors. Given that ghosts, secrets, children, and sexual repression are all prominent themes in the novella, it's surprising that so few musicologists have turned to the Freudian uncanny in their accounts of Britain's opera. An exception can be found in the work of Ruprecht, but even here he figures uncanniness more as a property of the blurring of thematic distinctions between the Garnets and the main ghost. Ruprecht's argument allows, nevertheless, for the possibility that uncanniness arises neither as a topic nor as harmonic undecidability, but rather uncanniness in Britain's turn of the screw emerges as a textual strategy, a reference to the script. And this is in keeping, though Ruprecht doesn't mention it, with post Freudian approaches to the uncanny found in the work of scholars such as Poirot, C.G., and Derrida. So my technical claim today is that Alessandro Calabi's production of Turn of the Screw actualizes a particular musico-dramatic strategy through which uncanniness emerges humanistically. I'll explore this through the ways in which the production stages and reworks the significations of a three-night motif, first presented on the Celesta, but recurs through the opera. This idea has been conventionally associated with the ghost of Peter Quint, the former valet of the children's guardian, and who the governess believes is trying to, or has already, corrupted Miles, the eldest of the two children. See how it is When Quint is on stage, the idea, whether melodic or harmonic, is said to refer to him, like a light motif or a falling card. When off stage, it signifies his influence on other characters. From a Freudian perspective, however, this kind of synchronic 
um, association of the motif, if meaning the same thing whenever it occurs, is insufficient to describe it as being uncanny. Not even the supernatural association that the painting is about, and that's actually a ghost. But Talebi's production, deliberately or otherwise, he was cagey in that way, it's when I spoke to him. But Talebi's production associates the motif, or we hear this motif, in conjunction with particular images, gestures, use of props, etc., that provide a visual means of developing the exploration of the inner lives of the characters and teases out the subtexts within the opera of infant, infant sexuality, childhood innocence, repression of desires, and WMs. In doing so, the motif accrues its uncanny significance diachronically as a consequence of these accumulated significations. Every time we hear the motif, it brings with it the traces, the sediments of the previous usage in the production, um, rather than just that same meaning each time it has through the story. And so in order to explore this, I'm going to offer a very potted survey of some of its most significant uses chronologically through the opera. Yay. So, actually, I should make a couple of observations. From this point on, if I refer to X happens or Y happens, um, I'm referring to the plot as it develops, specifically in the context of Pelagi's production. I don't want to keep having to reiterate this each time. It's annoying to do so. Um, and when I talk about any meaning that this quince motif accrues, I'm talking about in the context of the production of X. So whilst obviously there will be certain things that return from production to production because they're in the story and look like X, the meanings here emerge in the context of one particular production. Okay, so that being said, the first act um, in this production, the combination of music, the text and staging, establishes or sort of plays with the dual notion of homely as both homely and intimate on the one hand, and as um, uh, secret repressed concealment on the other. And what we see across the act is a gradual motion, not entirely linear, it moves back and forth, but a gradual motion towards homely as homely, established through ideas of family, security, happiness and children's games. Um, and this is reflected in the set design. You might just be able to see that there's a massive double bed in the centre, uh, where we first encounter the house where the toys distributed about. Um, the set is slightly off kilter, you've got a big window here and so on, and that would, in conjunction with what Sarah Tynan has done, moving around, Ooh, this is wonderful. It sort of captures something of the overwhelming properties of the house and this rush of visual stimuli going through. Um, but, but as experienced by the governess, these homely intimate qualities come over the course of the first act to be associated with the second meaning of family, concealed secrets. And so becomes imbued with potentially uncanny alternate meaning. meanings. And I say potentially because for uncanniness, remember, these secrets need to come to light. In the first act, they don't, they remain potential through this dual meaning of family. Let me show you how this happens. The first stirring, this first sense that we're moving from the first meaning of timeless intimacy, timeless secrets concealed, occurs in Act 1, Scene 3. The governess receives a letter. She's reading it here. Um, and it says that the child, Miles, has been expelled from school. As she reads it, the quince chord sounds for the first time in the orchestra. At this point, there are no intimations of ghosts. At this point, unless you know the opera, and I suppose many people will, but at this point, diachronically, chronologically in clock time, this chord represents something like that. We know Mark, well, we know Mark has been expelled from school, but we don't know why. The reason has been concealed. So the first point of hearing this chord, it unsettles. It takes us away from that kind of environment. Okay, so I'll, I'll just play this. You'll barely hear it. It's so surreptitious in the, the performance. Um, 
we'll hear a little bit of Mr. Croce and then you might just hear the sound underneath. It's this sound, oh, it's, there we might get speed through the quality and double ends of the echo. So now, yeah, interesting. Children lurking behind in this scene, they're just sick. and it's unclear whether it's just some sort of um, it's unclear whether it's uh, just a stage sort of thing or whether they are actually listening. Um, although, actually, in the theatre, you can see their facial, expre facial expressions show that they are listening intently, they're eavesdropping on this conversation, they're hearing the secrets about them. And so, as if to dispel doubts, they break into the nursery rhyme, Lavender's Blue, symbol of childhood innocence. And the governess, rather than, rather than confront Miles to find out what happens, puts the letter away in a drawer. So, the act of the children singing is kind of tied this. Sorry, it's really rubbish. <laughs> Okay, it's, I think it's significant here. Sorry, I've got a lot of music. Example, she had a fit there on you with all of your game sessions. Um, it's significant that Tulane's production doubles the children. I don't know if you picked up, but the children singing on stage are here. Um, the governess and Mrs. Croce, the housekeeper, move across the stage to witness um, minds behind the screen playing little children's game. The, the, the glass door that they're behind partially obscures our sight to mine. Presenting the games as if at the remove, as if the world of childhood play is inaccessible to the governess. And this is actually something that I think the lady drew from looking at the score because uh, whilst the adults sing in a largely dramatic idiom, the children sing in pure diatonicism, and so we get this contrast between the infant and the experience. Anyway, um, so it's as if the governess has never known or has repressed something about childhood. Or the children do. And what is true for the governess's lack of comprehension of childhood imagination and play is also true for her understanding of infantile sexuality. And we're going to come to that point soon and the way in which children's games are viewed through the darker lens of adult experience. Okay, but that's to come. Scene four re-establishes, reasserts the first meaning of Heinrich as homely, as intimate, as familiar, as cozy. For it begins with the governess singing of her love of the children and the beauty of her new home. Her thoughts then wander to her recollections of meeting the children's guardian, and she imagines what it would be like to encounter him again. Again, she sings a poem. I too am at home, alone, so Lady's production thematizes the governess's move from some sort of naive innocence to that of a desiring adult. And Sarah, as you'll see in this video, Sarah Tynan as a governess begins to sing of her wish to please the children's guardian and to see him again. And she lies down on the bed and strokes the covers wistfully. We then hear the quaint motif again and a figure appears in the window behind her. At first, the governess wonders if it's the guardian <laughs> himself, but rapidly realises it can't be. As the figure departs, the governess repeats the phrase. <laughs> the accompaniment mirrors her anxiety. The mystery identity is another secret that's presently concealed. We hear the chord again, not as a assertion of a ghost, supernatural, but as something we don't know. Um, and so this tilts this cause meaning again to the second meaning of Heinrich. But in the staging, we hear this chord 
and the governess is on the bed. In the, in the novella, in the stage directions, in the score, the governess is outside. The lady sleeps first in the bedroom. Um, and so what this does in the context of this production is it points to a, maybe a more fundamental secret. It's not just a secret about who is this figure in the window, but rather it's a secret firmly in the orbit of the uncanny. The governess is initially somewhat chaste erotic fantasy, suggests it's her sexual desire that is being concealed or repressed here. And it's her own fear of encountering it head on of it coming into her consciousness that caused her to witness the figure in the window. Thus the bed, which in the first few acts may have carried traces of Heimlich intimacy, has begun to accumulate two associations of sexual desire and drama, and it moves us again towards the repressed concealment of the second meaning of Heimlich. Oh yeah, I forgot that. Um, the uncanny mood is dispelled again at the start of scene five. It comes and goes, it comes and goes, but gradually and accumulating intensify. Um, and it goes because Miles and Flora, the children, the boy and the girl, sing another childhood song as they play in front of the governess. Tom Tom, the Piper's son. Now, this song, I've never got time to play it, but um, the lyrics, as often in childhood songs, point to something a little bit darker. Theft, beating, chasing. All of these are classic Victorian vices that could occur under the influence of corruption. And the physical interactions of the children in the Ultra North production tread a fine balance between sibling, ident uh, sibling intimacy and more sexually charged, potentially innocent, potentially not innocent, um, brackens. The children eventually leave the stage singing the song. Oh, no, I'll have to go through that. Um, then we hear Prince Mason again. And he appears in the window once more, this time making eye contact with the governess. Quince Gates then turns from the governess to follow the children as they move off stage. Or more figuratively, Quince has to sit on the top of the governess's head to be introduced to the children through the factor, through what Quince symbolizes to her. Um, but the direction of the gaze goes over the bed. The implication here is that um, whether it's a ghost, whether it's repression, she's seeing the children through this adult lens of sexual knowledge of um, the repression that they into her. So I've talked about all this and I've given this talk before and made a load of people really, really uncomfortable, but it's Freud's fault, not mine. Um, but a lot of this will come from Freud. Um, anyway, so she's viewing the children's games through the lens of Peter Quint. At this point, her only association of Quint is with sexual desires. Our association of Quint via this chord is beginning to accumulate aspects of sexual desire, doesn't it? Which is your scene. Um, uh, so the spectre of Quint and the spectre of his chord symbolizes the transformation of the, the childhood game. The first, the, you know, should be innocent, the first meaning of Heimlich. It's what children should do in their own homes, they said to play. But the chord, the moment, it, can, it, it gives us a double meaning, both homely and of repressed. Okay, so things begin to really, to, oh yeah. Oh. <laughs> So in the final two scenes of Act One, the secrets bound up in the sense of timely type finally overwhelm the familiar first meaning of the word. 
first, the governess believes that Flora, the young girl child, is refusing to admit she's seen a second ghost, the ghost of Miss Jessel, former governess, um, who was there, Miss Jessel. So again, you get another secret. Uh, the governess believes that there may be, well, actually, in this production, um, in the book and in the opera stage direction, Flora's sitting by a lake playing with dolls. In this, she's doing a puppet show with dolls, and the dolls end up doing something that they shouldn't do. Um, if you've ever seen the scene in America, they sort of order them on the scene. Um, no one's seen it? Oh, I can see people nodding, the rest of you. Um, um, so, uh, the governess believes that Flora and Miss Jessel, that there's something going on through this, um, and to materially deride from the fifth chord, she sings, they are lost, they are lost. The, co it, the chord has now utterly become bound up to notions of secrecy with notions of sexual corruption, um, with the notion that innocent children have been wronged. And it's at this point that we begin to have the seed sown for the uncanniness of the second act. The governess begins to resolve to bring these secrets out to the open to save the children. leads into the final scene of Act 1. The lady has the governess collapse on her bed, weeping, before falling into a fretful sleep. The ghosts of Quint and Miss Jessel then appear and talk directly to Miles and Flora. Is it happening in her dreams? Area? Is it happening in actuality, in the ghost story? And the production refuses to tell us. Sorry. Notice how the background of the set had actually changed from inside the house to a slightly different green light world with brightly coloured plants in the manner of um, an online Rousseau painting. And it's through this way, well, to Lady's production, the writer keep open the possibility that the children could just be children. And uh, Madeline Boyd's set design is designed to also reflect the children's world in bright primary colours and governesses in rather drab world. Okay, so. The sexual overtones of the children's games that we've seen also begin to adhere to Peter Quint. So when he actually starts to sing, we actually hear words from this ghost. So this is where Britain gives the ghosts words. Of course, it could still be what the governess imagines the ghosts would think. Um, but he sings, in me secrets half-formed desires meet. He's uh, culminating with the chord. Yes, it's the only thing. Um, the chord with the word secrets. And you might say, well, that's in Britain's score, but I'm arguing in Salady's production, those secrets have already been built up progressively and particular nature of those secrets that give this a meaning in this production, which we wouldn't have in just the score alone. And Miles repeats the words secrets. There's only about 44 more examples, you're all right. 
Now shirtless, having taken it off during this exchange with Quint, which is uncomfortable enough, gives the governess an unexpected kiss and climbs into bed. Um, as if to entice her to her side. This is innocent. This is just a child accidentally emulating what he's seen adults do a bit lower. Again, we don't know. Um, So what remains in Act 2 is the governess who is peering out of the schoolroom. And so the dramatic trajectory in the second half is how the repressed secrets get brought to life. And that's what makes it quite determining. Um, at first, the governess attempts to bring secrets to life by writing a letter to the Guardian. Miles, potentially under Quinn's influence, steals it. And then her tactic goes to forcing the children to confess their complicity with the ghosts. Um, here we have her first effort to get Miles to confess to um, speaking with Quint, but um, is there nothing you want to tell me? Uh, Quint suddenly pops in at the window. Um, so Miles, all it is, Miles doesn't. Miles represses him. But the difference now is the governess knows what the answer should be in her mind, whether it's a ghost story or her own projection of paranoia. So the chord suddenly is less about a secret repress, it's about a secret bubbling under the surface, waiting to come up. I'm just going to skip over this one for reasons of time. Um, ding, that's how the chord goes. Um, then we move to act, uh, to scene eight, the culmination, this is where it's all been leading. Um, Miles walks in dressed in quince clothes, no less, a Freudian doubling if ever there was one. At, the mo um, at this point, again, the governess asks Miles again, what do you have on your mind? And you hear Quint's chord and seductive tones. Is it Miles that has it on his mind? Uh, Quint's on his mind, the governess that has it on her mind. We don't know. Um, notice how they're lurking around the bed. I mean, it makes sense to put the centre stage, but it keeps the... Um, Sexual undertones of the chord and all of this. Again, I'm just going to skip this example. Um, get to the end. So, by the end, um, Quint and the governess are essentially forming a battle for mind and soul. Of course, back in the ghost story and the repressed one, the governess is just working through some issues. Um, and uh, the governess um, cries out, say the name, say the name, at which point Miles screams out, Peter Quint, you devil. It's unclear who the you devil is aimed at. Uh, Kalebi's decision to have the governess and Quint stand in here means it could be to either. But what we see is that they make the same gesture, sort of baffles convulsion, except in this performance they didn't quite do it in the same degree of synchronisation as they did in that. Some of the others, but you get the effect. The governess is much more exaltation. She's one quince emotion of despair. This is the uncanny revelation to which the opera and the production and the quint chord have been building. Um, the governess runs to Miles, clasps him, he dies in her arms. Why we don't know, shock, dispossession, smothering. We're left to decide uh, the chord 
and it was on with all of its meanings. <laughs> Remarks. My focus has been on staging rather than performance. We could go much more into detail about how the singers perform their, you know, use their voices to communicate nuance. Um, we could talk about how the motif links up with other thematic ideas. But even with these restrictions, I hope we've demonstrated that uh, the diachronically evolving emergent meanings that I've discussed can only come about through the um, blend of music, text, and production. They're not, they don't inhere in any one of the operatic media individually. But in doing so, I hope to have pointed towards some of the limitations of operatic studies that focus only on one media or the other in engaging with opera as perceived in the opera house um, and pointed the way towards a more inclusive response mode of operatic analysis. What's your eyes? The lights are coming on. Thank you very much. Hi, Ed. Nice to see you. Uh, just, just, just to say, um, I, I'm interested in the idea um, of uncanny uh, for obvious reasons. Um, I, I wonder whether you think there is uh, an argument for there being uh, an uncanny musical topic and if there is any evidence of that in the Britain. So um, the answer is probably, um, but I think, um, so I'm thinking particularly of the work of Michael Sherlin and um, Michael, uh, Michael Klein in um, essentially uh, using the ombre as a signification for the uncanny. And I think um, to the extent that through, and I think uh, we, we find uncanniness, particularly when it occurs in the supernatural context, often drawing on the ombre topic. But I think there has to be more to it than just the sound. I think it's the way of the repression coming back at least in the Freudian sense, the Freudian uncanny, is how we bring that back. And so just a diminished seventh tremolando isn't necessarily going to be uncanny in the way that Sherlin and Klein use it. So I think it has to be um, contextual, that I think the ombre topic is often used in an uncanny situation, but the uncanny situation is also amplified by text or staging. I'm thinking operatically primarily here. We've also got Rick Cohn talking about a um, particular harmonic undecidability um, with neo romanian type progressions, which might again dramatically in that context be uncanny, but I'm not sure I follow his argument all the way through that whenever we get these progressions at C major to A flat minor or as equivalent, that it's always going to be uncanny. I think the uncanny needs to come with that um, psychological element as well as an aesthetic or um, structural one. So if there is, I think, well, actually, is there going to be an uncanny topic distinct from ombre or distinct from these harmonic things? I struggle to believe that, but I think there would be uncanny textual practices, the way in which um, texts pull up these repressions. So it might be that the uncanny is more of a textual strategy than a pure topic. You clearly shown us in dramatic phases yeah. as it emerges um, through the production values as well as, oh. as implied by the music, but taken a little further through yeah. the director's intervention. Thank you so much. For my Thank you. Hello, my name is Enrique. Uh, and the title of the presentation is Women in Mozart and Aponte, but uh, well, I'm here more as a historian than a musician because I started with research uh, when I was studying the degree in history, and then I started to sing and then I started to read about opera. And I realized that there were like two visions about music that wasn't exactly what I was learning in, at the university. The first one that's completely outdated 
by musical signification <laughs> is the technical one. Uh, when we see an opera, we, we have the score and we make a technical analyze, analysis about uh, music in, in an abstract way. And that's nothing, that's not interesting, I think, for, for what I was interested in, that was to politicize art, to, to make politics from art, uh, and I was learning that it was possible to do with history. And then I, I look for more recent bibliography, and I found that there was another problem. problem. It was not technical, but it was an emotion. What does this music make, make me, makes me feel? Or what does this work of art makes me feel? And it's, I found that it was very individualistic point of view that uh, didn't allow us to make politics. So, what can I do? <laughs> As I was um, studying history, I thought that there were two, well, like uh, a path that we were in. I didn't know musical signification, which had been, would have been easier. So I had to find my own way. And my own way was through archaeology, even though it's strange. Uh, I found some uh, archaeology theories that were interesting from an artistical point of view. Uh, why? Because I think that music is more or less like an archaeological site. And because when, when you arrive to, uh, to an archaeological site, you have a lot of pieces of evidence that you have to organize somehow because it, it, it's, it's too much. You have to have a theory that tells you what is important, what's not important, and what are you looking for. Because if you don't know what the question you you want to answer, maybe it's better not to start any research. Uh, so I found two two, two archaeological theories that were, were very interesting. And well, the first one is the I'm sorry because the images are in Spanish. They're from books and an article. And I'm, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the first one is the theory of uh, the production of social life of the third. Uh, it was uh, elaborated by a, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's the name. And it's it's by it, it was elaborated by the women. Uh, she was she was Barcelona, and it's it's a theory that comes from Marxism, and it's like more elaborated and more concrete, because she found that there were three production, three economical productions. Uh, the productions of bodies, because she she thought that that it was an economic an economic activity, the production of objects that is traditional production, and the production of maintenance of these bodies and these objects, and from there she derived uh, some practices, and I'm not going to explain the whole theory, but I will tell that the ones that we're interested in are the political ideological practices that are not linked directly to any mm, specific production because they're like everywhere. She she defined the, this these practices, I will read it. Uh, these are the practices which through agreement, impositions or compromises are intended to establish Either forms of social cooperation or social exploit or either forms of social exploitation in a certain community. Uh, these activities are very important because uh, depending on this, on, on what these activities propose, the human beings are going to act some way or uh, in a way or in another. Because the human being 
needs assent to what uh, they're doing. And these political politic ideological practices are not only what we now would say that political, that the parliament or something like that, but also the, the coach, the yeah, that's explaining us how our society is going to be organized, who is going to work, where, how much time, uh, who is going to consume the, the thing that, that we produce, and if it's going to be fair or if it's not, or, or, if, or if it's going to be unfair. We'll accept these unfair things if they are correctly explained in the political ideological practice. And here I find the connection with feminism because um, we live now in a society that it's not saying I'm going to say these are two, two philosophers, two feminist philosophers that are alive and are working now in a in a perspective that says that we don't live anymore in a, in a hard patriarchy that tells us, or not that tells us, but that obliges us to do things through law or, or through coercion, but through free consent. It's like neoliberalism. I don't know if this is this correct in English, neoliberalism. neoliberalism. Uh, and they give us the option to choose. If I want to choose to be a mother, I can be a mother. If I don't want to be a mother, it's okay. But through the political ideological practices, they are saying us what to do, what's fair, and what's not fair. And and Ana de Miguel uh, asks herself, if we are now in a, in a society that says that we have a, a ministry of equity, we have an uh active politics programs about equality uh, between men and women we have um equality under the law where is the inequality reproducing itself which is this in culture so i think that we have to find because they, they are, there are a lot there is a lot of women that are being raped that are being killed where Where's the problem? And she says in culture, because culture tells us how to live. And where's the important things in life? Where are the important things in, in life? Where, which is the scent of our existence? And what do we want? This is, these are things that we learn through films, through opera, through music, through uh, literature, etc. And then I will present them the next um, theory. The, this is my theory. Oh. This is a theory, an archaeological theory that started uh, or that has its, its, that was born studying the cave paintings in, in Spain, in the east of Spain. And I will tell you the research quickly because I think it's easier to understand. And she, uh, she found that the representations of men hunting were like, I would say by, I, I would say by heart, like 90% of the paintings and the representations of mm, women gathering were 10 persons. And then she makes the analysis in the archeological sites, the bones, etc., And she found that the diet was 90% female gathering, 10% men hunt, male hunt. So she said, I don't know what they wanted to tell me through the paintings. I don't know the, the symbol, the significance, the meaning, 
but I know the science. And that's enough to say that there is an overrepresentation of male activity. As, and somehow they're hiding the, the, the activity of women. And we are right now to, to, to the point that I wanted to leave you, that's that the sign is more important than the, than the mean, from my point of view. Well, she makes a classification like uh, figurative representations uh, transmit uh, rules, social rules, and they can be coercive, they can be alienating, or they can be transgressive. And that we'll talk about later. But why, why do I find that, uh, that, that it is important to look to the signs and not to the symbol? Because sometimes we forget that the character doesn't exist. You know? That's it, that opera is not a presentation, but a representation. And if we cannot make an analysis of the character, because the character does not exist, it, it, it's not a person, it's only what uh, usually a man, the composer and the libertist, decided to, to represent, represent in front of people to transmit um, social rules that can be in for or against the, the, social, the, the social rules that are already established. And now we're going to the second part. I don't know if, if I have many time. Uh, we'll talk about Le Figaro. And um, well, we have um, two ideas that are like really settled about the Nocidifica. The first one is that it is a transgressive voice against the old regime. And I will tell you what, I suppose you all know this book. Well, I can't wait. Uh, she says that it's a fight against uh, again, a fight between the binary rhythm and the ternary rhythm, and that the binary rhythm is the old regime, and the ternary rhythms are the, the regime that's being brought by the women. But this, this is not a feminist analysis. An analysis. Uh, what has been written from feminism about the Nazi Figaro is that it is a, a revolutionary document because there is a female French, the Countess and Suzanne. And sometimes I've, I've, I've read the, the citation of Virginia Woolf in A Room of Oneself that said about, about another work of art, it's not about the Nazi Figaro. And in this work of art, uh, there is also a, a female French. She said, it was very important for me because I found that sometimes women like themselves. They don't have to, to like man always. And Le Nocturne Figaro is important because it's a friendship between women and not women in, in, in like, like, they are very, it's very important there is the count that separates them. And they are not separated by the count. They are um, closer because the count, the, the, the husband of the countess, is trying to flirt with Susanna. But that in, in our in our lead, well, in our tradition, that would mean that the two women are enemies. But in this opera, they are closer because of, of, of the man that's between them, between them. Well. Uh, I think that this idea that, that Le Nozze di Figaro is a revolutionary feminist opera is completely wrong. And I will explain superficially why. Uh, the first thing that I did when I started to study Le Nozze di Figaro was to, to, to gather information. And the information is that the 18th century was the time of change. Everything was changing. The society was in going or, or was arriving to capitalism and nation states, a, a new way of thinking that that's the enlightenment, enlightenment and so on. And that also implied a new consideration of women that would derive in the hard patriarchy of the 19th century. And I think that in this line is where we should put the Nazi 
because I won't only talk about the counter because we don't have more time, but the counter is a character that Mozart and La Ponte made bigger in the opera than in Beaumarchais original play. The two uh, the two areas of 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 the countess, this is from a book that are made up by the one, are not based in 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 Bomershen. And that's important because they had to cut a lot of things because Bomershe was completely the, the original play was completely crazy and they didn't have time to do it in an opera. But they decided to make bigger the character of the countess. And these two areas are musically mm, melodies that Mozart has already used in 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 Agnes Day, in the moment of the of the mass, when everyone prays uh, about the self sacrifice of, of the holy lamb. And I think that that's not mm, something that Mozart did without knowing. Uh, without realizing the meaning, he found that the Holy Lamb needed the this or the Countess needed the same music, the same kind of music than the Holy Lamb. That's an information, and there is another thing that I would like to underline. It's that they uh, make the Countess the purest character in the opera. They clean the the character. Because in, in the play, she flirts with Cherubino a lot. And in the opera is, well, something that you can see, you can imagine the, 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 the stage uh, director decides if it's going to be bigger or smaller. But we also have information in the text about the, the cleaning of, of, of the purity of the countess, because there are phrases, phrases that are not, are not based in Bomershin and the areas. For example, Susanna said, se la mano le femmine, an cerco il loro perché. If women like their women, they have a good reason. That's not in, in, in Bomershin. That's a way to, to say, eh, well, the Countess is fascinated by Kiruvino, and that's logical. El boy que sapete, it's you all that know about love, but in the in, in Bomerche, Kiruvino sings mm, mal, mal that's a story of a soldier that's in love with his godmother. And the Countess is the godmother of Kiruvino. And all, all these things are not in the other. So if we have the self-sacrifice information of the areas, and we have the modifications that the Ponte and Mozart made to, to make the Countess mm, a pure thing, I would like to, to arrive to a conclusion or, or to, to, to present some conclusions about the feminism in the non the first thing is that there is, as someone has said, a feminine space with a feminine relationality. Mm, that's the, the Countess room and the relation between Susanna and the Countess, and that's true. But mm, I will bring another word. I don't know if, I don't know if, it's, if it exists in, in, in English. Elia Moros is a feminist philosophy, a philosopher uh, from Madrid, and she created this term, heterodesignation, to talk about what happens usually with women. And it just means that mm, women are designated by another. So, do we have a feminine relationality and a feminine space in the Notre Dame? Yes, but is it really a feminine space? 
are women what we are seeing in Linux City Figaro, or are representations of women made by men? Because I think that there is no women in Linux City Figaro that doesn't suffer at the hands of Adam, that doesn't spend the whole opera trying to, to make him change, and that doesn't re that it, it, they're all happy at the end because they have the men they want. So I don't know if that's a woman or what men thought a woman was. And in the line from 18th century to the hard patriarchy of the, of the 19th century, I think that the Countess is a figure that links the sentimental heroine from the beginning of the 18th century to the, I don't know if that term exists in English, but in Spain, we, in, in Spanish, in, in Spanish literature, there are like two terms that are the women in the 19th century, the femme fatale and the angel in the house. And I think the Countess is a pre-angel in the house. And that's everything that I'm going to say <laughs> because I think I can talk a lot. In spite of the fact they want to start this tour early, we have time for questions. <laughs> I think I have some thoughts along these lines. One thing that occurred to me is that in the third play that Beaumarchais wrote, the Countess runs off with Carabino. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps she uh, liberates herself in that sense but, and moves even beyond the expectation of this fascinating. Um, Point that you're making that the character is not the, the actual person, but it gives us some vision of how women were beginning to be seen somewhat differently at this time, even though by men. Yeah. <laughs> um, we think that there are always images of repressed women, but uh, in Fidelio, for example, Beethoven's only opera, uh, she gets the name Fidelio because she's faithful to her husband, and that might seem, you know, part of the patriarchy. But on the other hand, she dares and has the courage to go and do what she needs to do to try to rescue. Them. So she is the, the active figure with the daily opera is a forest on. It's just uh, sitting and waiting. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's the problem because we see a, a woman that's empowered and we're all happy. But <laughs> well, um, I don't say we're happy, well, but, but I mean, it does feel all that he, but all it does feel like rather are happy. But, Something different. Don't you tell the tells women what for what should they should be active and for what not? And they always yeah. should be active to, to have the love of a man. Yeah. The yeah. Countess, Leonora, or whoever. And yet at the same time, with all of what Beaumarchais is doing with the liberty and so forth, and um we see, I mean, he was arming ships to send weapons and uniforms to the United well, to the American colonies to fight against the British of all things. He never got paid back for that. But at any rate, he was quite active in, in many ways. But I think this notion of uh, changing views of women are beginning to happen by men who have some degree of enlightenment and recognize that that they do have agency and yeah. that they can scheme and plot and, <laughs> and foil the account into asking for their forgiveness, which is quite good. <laughs> so, um, maybe just a small step in that direction. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. It's more a kind of unfiltered story at the moment, but um, just about your lineage from the Countess by the angel and the of Helen, I think where I'm struggling to see that is that the angel and femme fatale is still largely viewed through the male gaze. That, you know, it's either women as virgin or whore, really, in that sense. And I, and I was thinking, well, who is the descendant of the Countess? And I was wondering if it was the Marshal Lynn in their auto career. Um, and there we have, you know, uh, someone who is musing on aging and love and loss and so on. And I wonder whether that's. I don't know, maybe you know it better because I think that's very a very interesting example because it's not a woman that's only concerned about love, it's concerned about herself. 
And I think that's only possible in a Freudian context in Vienna. Mm -hmm. And that that's your your point, not mine. <laughs> yeah, so many more things. <laughs> yeah. But very interesting.